Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Heller. I'm with Deloitte's financial advisory business, and I spend my days in big data and analytics type of work for clients. I am really pleased to be here today, um, especially because we get to hear from our esteemed panel. In a minute, I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Um, they're going to talk about big data and transactions. Now, this is all about using big data to extract value through analytics and make better decisions. So let me just take one minute to set it up, and then I'll pass it off to the panel to introduce themselves. So big data has transformed industries and continues to do so, including the lending industry. From new approaches to modeling and risk, to improved KYC, incorporating AI, the impact of open banking, and alternative lending and credit. So to ground ourselves, big data is the incredible volume of data we capture through all the ways that we touch clients, including the constant updates through real-time data. And importantly, the different types of data or alternative data that is now available. This big data helps people uncover insights that lead to better decisions and new opportunities. And the variety of data of these large data sets is really used to reveal patterns, trends, and associations that we simply couldn't analyze a few years ago. As an example, you can now take satellite images of all the Walmart parking lots over time, and you'd have a pretty good idea if they're going to hit their quarter or not. Now, that's not a lending example, but it's an interesting example because big data has structured data and unstructured data. Structured is, an example would be numbers. Unstructured data is where you get into video, text, and photos. And what's important is what do companies do with this data? What are the decisions that they make? How do we extract value through analytics? And I define analytics as turning data into insight to set, execute, measure, refine, and pivot strategy. So with that set up, I'd like to invite our panel to introduce themselves, and then we'll get to the questions. I guess I'm starting off. I'm Stacy Schachter, founder of Vion Investments. We're funded by a, a PE firm out of New York, managing about five billion in capital, and primarily we are doing lender finance. Hi, good afternoon. I'm uh, Rajan Ariyur. I think this is a panel of uh, mostly founders, and I am not the founder of Sun Life. We uh, invest in portfolios of cash flow generating contracts. Good afternoon, Dan Lee with Convest Partners. We're a private equity firm based in West Palm Beach. Um, I'm a partner in our lending business, and especially finance is one of our areas of focus. Uh, over the last 20 years, my uh, partners have closed about 50 transactions, uh, which represents about two billion, over $2 billion of, of invested capital. And we've looked at many, many times that uh, number of deals in the space. Um, and so we think that makes us one of the um, sort of premier lenders in the, in the specialty finance sector. Hi, my name is John Markle. I uh, apologize for the delay in getting here. I actually just got off a flight from where we're based, which is San Francisco. Uh, we are uh, a merchant bank that advises technology companies uh, on debt, debt capital raises. Um, we're fairly active. This year we'll do roughly about $2 billion in financings, up from about one and a half billion last year, so we see a lot. We work with about 150 different lenders, and we get pretty much all of our deal flow from the venture capital community um, in what I would describe as the Western world. And uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Great, thank you. So, so first question for Rajan: um, How has your firm changed its approach to using data and analytics over the past five to ten years? What changes took place? What new sources of data do you review? And how have you organized internally around analytics? Uh, we haven't changed a single thing. Each time we want to fund, we pull that big subledger out and start writing stuff in. And No, just kidding. Uh, obviously, the crisis uh, 10, 12 years ago uh, you know, resulted in a number of changes uh, for various businesses. So it impacted uh, how we do business as well. And more recently, I would say, uh, two things. One, all, I would say, most of our relationships are long-term relationships where we are constantly funding. So we don't do the typical uh, deals of buying a $300 million portfolio and it amortizes down. Ours are all mostly flow finance facilities. So every month, most of our relationships are funding. So we have a constant touch point. 
So what that leads us to is now we pay more attention to, you know, each time a tranche comes into fund, we look at the, uh, you know, we like spreadsheets. Uh, if it's, we are buying 300 contracts, it's 300 rows and whatever number of columns for each of those rows with, uh, with fields that matter. And we do a lot of stratification. We actually look at underlying credits on a sample basis and analyze how this tranche looks compared to the prior three, four, five tranches that we have funded. Are there any migration in credit quality or other metrics that has happened over time? Because as I said, we have an um, annual uh, touch point with the companies where the businesses, what are they changing? Why they are changing? Does it make sense? Is it something new that they're entering into? If it is, then please test them on your own dime and then if it works, we will come in and support you. So from that perspective, you know, there is a lot more analysis done because we truly believe we got to spend more time upfront before the deal comes in because once it's funded, then it's ours because these are all non-recourse deals in our facilities. We don't look to the, the originator to repay us. We are relying on the underlying cash flows of the contract. So we kind of truly live and die by the underlying cash flows. And so we spend a lot of time upfront understanding what the company does, but more importantly, when tranches come in, analyzing those and comparing it to what has happened more recently from a trend perspective. Great, thank, thank you. Maybe as a follow-up question, uh, John, being working in San Francisco, I'm wondering if you have a perspective on the same question around how the firm uses data and analytics um, as new sources of data and how they organize around analytics internally. So, I think my perspective will be one that's fairly uh, myopic in that it, it really focuses on technology companies. Um, right now, we're seeing lenders kind of already use big data analytics. Uh, just even here in Toronto, a new firm called ClearBank, they basically don't listen to a word the CEO says or the CFO says. They just say, give us your marketing data, give us your marketing spend. We're going to use that to figure out what your advance rate or borrowing base is going to be, and we'll lend on that. Um, and there's other folks that have been doing that for a few years, just not here, guys like Brex.com and, and, and others. So I think um, that sort of thing is happening. And the interesting thing, uh, I think unlike many of the folks here, although I know Comvest does this from time to time, is most of the lenders we work with uh, are not asset-based lenders. They're not cash flow lenders like um, what Brajan does. Uh, they're what are referred to as enterprise value lenders. So these are lenders that are working with companies that are cash flow negative, uh, sometimes don't have any kind of horizon to see when they're going to be cash flow positive. So what that means is they rely on a whole host of data sources that suggest company health, that suggest enterprise value. These might be a subset of what the company uses as their own internal key performance indicators um, that, that derive value for that company. I think the low-hanging fruit that most people in the room probably understand is, is recurring revenue. Enterprise software companies uh, value themselves on, oh, we have you know, 78 million of annual recurring revenue and we have a churn rate of X percent and lenders use that and, and they use it quite uh, meticulously in that a company that has X in recurring revenue and Y in churn might price at you know L plus five and a half, whereas another company with identical qualitative aspects where that Y value in churn might be you know Y plus three percent and it'll price 500 basis points richer than that. So they really do rely on the internal operating metrics of the company to make decisions. So I, I, I don't see that going away. I think that's going to become more and more uh, a staple to how they think about credit risk. Excellent. Thank you. Um, question for Dan. Uh, what have you seen from, from the entities that you fund in their approach to the analytics, and what would you like to see from them? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So we've, I think I mentioned, we've financed uh, about 50 platforms, and on average, those platforms have about 10,000 underlying borrowers. And if you just sort of tease out 10,000 borrowers with 
20 to 50 to 100 different underwriting criteria uh, and the time series of data across which they, they produce their results, you get to a very, very quickly to an overwhelming um, amount of data, in, unless you have a management team that knows how to navigate it and how to determine um, how to separate the noise from the um, critical data. And so we're really looking for management teams that can show us, can dem demonstrate a history of navigating um, with the data, including when it's misled them and may have kind of taken them in a direction where, where it challenged their business. Um, we understand that, that growth brings challenges and we're, we're fine with that. That's part of what, why we're here. Um, but we're really looking for um, management teams that can get us the right sort of information, the right data, and are also open and transparent with us and understand that having an open dialogue is gonna be critical to navigating those relationships and, and to us helping support their growth in the, uh, in the kind of maximum way that, that we're capable of. Um, so it's, it's really as much communication on the data um, as well as knowing, knowing what matters, taking kind of, I would say, really an evolutionary rather than revolutionary uh, approach to, to the way they manage using the data. Great. Thank you. So I'd also like to address the same question. I know, Stacey, if you have a view on the, in the entities you find, what is their approach to data analytics and what would you like to see from them? Yeah, you know, I have to agree with Dan on that. We're very similar to Combes in the way we think about data. But uh, I'm going to try and get some audience interaction here. So uh, people have to stop looking at their phones. Um, and, and just curious, how many people in the room, just by a show of hands, have embraced big data? Now, keep those hands up. How many of you are actually scared of big data? <laughs> okay. uh, half the hands went down. So um, I am scared of big data because for me, and probably for Dan and the other people here, and for most of you, data is just the starting point. It's not the end point. And we take a look at all these different transactions that we're looking at. And so, we're not going to be an MCA company, but we're the funder behind an MCA company. We're not going to be a buy here, pay here lender, but we'll be the money behind a buy here, pay here lender. And it all comes down to what are the inputs into that big data. And I, I always chuckle when somebody comes to me and they go, we have a proprietary model. Well, everybody's model is proprietary in a way, right? But it's got to be, if it's not based on actual data, then your model doesn't necessarily hold water with me. So I'm, I'm more the negative big data guy. And so let's have another show of hands. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Monte Carlo simulations? Mm -hmm. yeah, most, most of you are familiar with Monte Carlo simulations. And so I had a spirited discussion with my CIO about Monte Carlo because somebody came in and they'd done Monte Carlo simulations. And I said afterwards, what do you think? And she said, I think it's a load of crap. And I said, well, why do you think that? Well, because they actually have no actual data from prior transactions to rely upon. So it's, it's typically garbage in, garbage out. Um, I have my own test for something like when I'm looking at an MCA company that you'll never find in big data. What kind of car does the founder drive? If they're driving a Lamborghini or Maserati or something else like that, that's an immediate no for me and I'm out. So, um, and, and I don't mean to bogart the mic, but I can't help myself. I um, wanted to just read you something here. This is very recent, just a couple months old, uh, from Bloomberg. And talking about, again, big data, and you could look at companies like Lending Club and Prosper and what happened to their pools of receivables based on all these 200, 300,000 input type things. And, uh, and this is something that um, came out of uh, Fitch. It says, it's unclear how the debt will perform in a recession, and defaults may be high if the economy slows, and consumers focus on paying loans they perceive as more important, such as their mortgages or credit card debt. And uh, if that's true, and this is uh, Fitch analyst uh, Eric Orenstein, he said, bonds backed by the loans could be clobbered. Well, if the bonds are getting clobbered, What's happening to the loans? And for those of us who fund loans, that means the loans are getting clobbered. So um, that's just a little bit of, of my take on big data. I have some actual true stories to go through, but I need to let others talk. All right, we'll come back to this. 
<laughs> so, so maybe a question for, uh, for John. Um, what do you see happening in the next few years with data and analytics in the lending space? Uh, predictive modeling, uh, the new data sources, how does it affect decision making? Well, I guess I could build on what yeah. Stacy said a little bit, um, and, and I, I approach things. I'm an engineer with a math degree, so uh, there's there's good and bad with data. Uh, one is you have it and you can use it. Uh, the other is if you know what it's telling you, you can also find holes in it, uh, and there's often arbitrage opportunities. And part of Part of what companies' challenges are is figuring out what's good data and what's bad data, so this question of data integrity. And we actually work with uh, a number of technology companies that are trying to solve that problem. Um, you know, you mentioned social media. We work with a company, or worked with a company, raised money for it, where they, they scrape um, all social media, they, they sell a piece of software to big brand companies, whether it's Walmart, Exxon, you know, you name it. And what their software does is protect that company or that brand against the proliferation of false data. So they scrape sources, they look at how consistent the data is in terms of how that brand is being used or marketed, and they compare it against how it was being used or marketed from the company approved sources, whether it's agencies, the company itself, in-house marketing. And they use AI to say, hey, th this isn't right over here. You should, you should take that down. So it's happening more and more. I mean, there's, there's automated software now that does that, that large companies can say, we're really nervous about how much data there is out there and how much of it is not ours, but looks like ours. So I, I think more and more companies are going to rely on some sort of way to test data integrity and, and protect themselves. Great points. Um, maybe, Rajan, you, you have a very different industry uh, than, than John. What, do you see some things in your area that, for the future, you think are going to be impacting the business? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, you know, we are at this conference, so you know, we are interested in this space and uh, uh, want to learn more about it. But, you know, for us, it is, again, to Stacey's point, data is one source. Uh, you know, it's a good old adage of just because it can be counted doesn't mean it counts. So you know, just because we have all these data fields doesn't mean all of them are useful and all of them are going to tell us something about the, about the portfolio. To us, the starting point is, what is the underlying business? What is the experience of the management? Have they done this before? Uh, and yeah, some of the things we are talking about and people in the, in the room here, it's fairly new, a lot of the businesses, we get that, but what is the management experience or, you know, uh, how did, why are they in this business, right? It's getting that feel and we are the safe money. So we are not the growth capital, we are not the equity, so we want those capital to be put to use ahead of us before we will put our money in because ours is you know, effectively a senior debt at fairly reasonable rates, I would like to think. So for the four sub 6% type returns, we don't you know, want to uh, put, the, put the capital at risk because regardless of how progressive we may be in our thinking, we are a 150 year old life course. So you know, first and foremost is preservation of capital and, but having said that, you know, if data is there, that is useful, then we, we love it and uh, we would like to learn more from it. Great. I mean, the reliance on the experience of management, as you say, is critical. And with data and analytics, it does lend to using data analytics possibly in ways that are not ideal. And maybe, Stacy, this is a great time to circle back with you. Have you seen some examples where uh, confidence people have come forth uh, with data and analytics, but it really didn't hold water. Yeah, and look, every time I've seen bad data, I've lost a hair on my head, and um, unfortunately, I'm publicly challenged. What I was trying to say before, and by the way, don't get the impression that I don't embrace big data as well, because I do. Um, it does scare me. So some of the, let me give you a, a really good example. Um, 
and I like using real life stories. So we were very recently working on a large timeshare transaction. And the history on that was actually enormous. Lots and lots of securitizations. So there's a lot of data that you can uh, look at. And we actually signed the contract. It was a $250 million spend for us. And just days before we were gonna do our first funding, we walked away from the deal. Well, why? Well, we had been waiting for data from our counterparty um, to sort of see what was going on in the industry. Now, this is prime FICO scored people, not subprime, prime, and the default rate was already around 21%. So we had done some modeling, and we got the latest data in, and it's multiple locations. Some centers were now over 31%. And that sort of gave us a bit of a heart attack. And we started digging into the data. And we said, okay, well, maybe we can put in some brackets. And based on FICO score, we'll just do some FICO score banding and we can still do the deal. And we saw something that was very unusual. The higher the FICO score, the higher the default rate, which is so counterintuitive at that point, we can no longer predict, given the past data, what the future was going to be, and we had to walk away from the deal. Now, what was going on is if you, I don't know if this is true in Canada, certainly in the United States, there's lots of advertisements, especially late at night, for people, get out of your timeshare. And that's because 80, I think it's 87% of people who buy timeshares wish they never bought them in the first place. And as it turns out, there's a correlation between higher FICO score people wanting to actually get out of that investment, but not necessarily doing so because they didn't want to hurt their FICO score. So um, that's an example of just one type of transaction where the management team thought they really knew what was going on with their data, and then when they actually presented it, I think it surprised them as well. So data kind of saved you in that case. Pardon? Data kind of saved you. Uh, yeah, the data one. saved us. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel as well. Um, it's always fun to hear stories of things to avoid. Um, have you had any, any stories around the use of data and analytics where it didn't quite go the way you thought it should? Yeah, I would just say, you know, I think sometimes the, the data can certainly be wrong, and there's, there's oftentimes it's wrong and misleading, but as often it's the interpretation of the data, and, um, and, or it's not, the data's not telling you what you want, what you want it to. And as an example, uh, when we've, we've been doing uh, especially finance in the United States for a long time, uh, 20 years, and did our first deal up in Canada a couple of years ago. And when we first got the, um, we've done three uh, to date, and when we first, first got the default and recovery stats from these businesses, we told our analysts, that can't be right. That's just, the, that's, that, that performance is way too good relative to what we were used to in U.S. borrowers. And so the data was right. Canada is a much better place. To, the borrowers here are much more responsible. And that's why I'm here. So thank you. <laughs> a couple of things. One, you know, data, again, on that note, I had the reverse experience. Um, got some data from, the, uh, uh, from one of the US prospects. We originate millions of volume. Our loss rate, static loss rate is 1%. OK, great. And then to delve in, they originate 100 million, 80 million is sold off, 20 million is the managed book, and 1% is calculated on the 100 million of origination, but the actual loss is actually five times that because it's on the 20 million that they manage. So, you know, delving into the data as to not taking it at face value is, is key. Um, and then we have in our own portfolios seen same consumers uh, in different portfolios, performances different. And it comes down to, you know, how do the deal comes in, come in, and what are the, you know, how is it originated, and what happens. Uh, there have been other instances where somebody has been in the consumer uh, space for a long time, but they start a new vertical, and we all think, oh, it's the same consumer, similar origination, and same criteria, so it has to perform similar. It doesn't, and it hasn't. So, again, data is just one one source, one point of reference, that is the business model and other things that, that go behind that uh, has to prove itself. Okay. Would you have a, another, another example, John? 
Mine's from a long time ago. Actually, Rajan and I used to work together uh, in, in a previous life at uh, CIBC World Markets. And we worked in structured and leveraged finance. And one of the things that, that our group used to do was finance film finance companies. And the way these, these companies were securitized, and I, I think Stacy brought up the whole Monte Carlo simulation, was you'd get reams and reams of data. And back then, there was no AI to sort through it. So that was, I was AI. I was, I was the junior guy building the models to figure out, OK, what does this stuff do? So we took years and years and years of data um, for a company called Village Roadshow. And the way film finance worked back then was you would look at the historical performance of how well films did by way of looking at how successful the distribution rights um, were monetized. So you'd build this big model, and then you'd run a Monte Carlo simulation. And the only variables were, well, how many sigma, how many standard deviations do you want to look at how valid the data is. And we're like, well, why don't we? And the limitation was computing horsepower. So if you wanted to do one, well, OK, well, that was, that was a Monte Carlo simulation that would, that would run overnight. If you wanted to do two, that was three days. So you had to balance that stuff. So we would get a couple computers going and run like four or five Monte Carlo simulations. We'd be like, OK, good. So we need you know 2% credit enhancement on this deal. And then a year later, they'd blow through it because they sold you know, rights to the matrix, which even though you could take that data and lump it in with the broader scope of data, but it, it, it didn't behave like it. So if you had subsets of data within the, the bigger set of data, it totally skewed performance and, and note holders got, got screwed. So I learned years ago, I'm like, hmm, it, sometimes you can't rely on what the math is telling you. If I can, the matrix was the only one to perform relative to the other ones and how they were priced. Uh, one other thing to throw in there too is that when you talk about the number of data points, therefore the more iterations you have to sort of go through, you get that in most cases a, a some sort of bell curve, and you talk about the standard deviation one or two percent. Um, what we do in, is, is essentially do a war room before a deal of what went wrong in the deal. What could go wrong? Well, everybody can anticipate recession, but what are the black swan events? Change in law. That's happened to us. Change in law wiped out over half of our profit in one deal. Uh, and you start sitting, if you, if you plan for the horrible things before they actually happen, you need to be responsible enough to think about that one or 2% chance on the fringes on the downside of that bell curve as to what could go wrong. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to do anything about it, but at least you'll be pre pre prepared of well, what if this does happen. And, and that's one of the exercises we go through. Cool. I think as we close here, one of the things I hear uh, from the panel is, although there are some companies who strictly rely on data and don't even meet the CEO to make decisions, uh, overwhelmingly, and I think we've heard in other presentations, the human in the loop uh, is still critical uh, today, and it might be for, for a very long time. Uh, but I'd be curious to see how those companies do over the long term who rely more on data uh, and don't even bother meeting management. It's very interesting. Um, is anyone like a closing remark before we close up? I, I, I think it's funny that we work with a ton of companies, and especially back when I did structured finance, the, you know, all of my sort of senior managers would say, we, ne we need to make sure the model's right. We need to make sure everything's accurate. And, oh, okay, this thing requires 2.8% credit enhancement because these billion reams of data suggest it. Okay, well, then let, let's take that number and multiply it by three and we're good. W why? Mm -hmm. Well, just to be safe. <laughs> Everyone in this room does that. So it, it, it's just funny. Well, why do all the extra? Why don't you just guess? It would save a bunch of people a lot of time and money. And I'm just, I, to this day, I don't know why people don't just guess based on feel. Good point. All right, let's say a big thank you to everybody on the panel for their time and expertise. Thank you.